Welcome to the ROTC Scholarship Podcast, hosted by former Army ROTC Professor of Military Science, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Rob Kirkland. In these episodes, we explore how to best prepare yourself to obtain one of these valuable scholarships for those applicants who wish to attend a college or university and become officers in the military. The application process can be complex and confusing. This podcast works to make it more understandable. And now, the ROTC Scholarship Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. It's great to have my partner in crime, Trish Doc, with me. Trish, how are you doing today? Great, sir. And excited to talk about Air Force. And today we are going to talk about your favorite service, the Air Force. Right. Both Air Force Academy and Air Force ROTC. And so many students come into this not knowing what they should talk about, what to say. And I think our goal here today is to just walk you through a few different answers, talk about what's good, talk about what could be improved upon so that you have an idea when it's time for you to interview, the, the types of things that these officers that are going to be interviewing you or congressional panels for the academy are looking for. Without further ado, I think we should just go into these questions and uh, and then kind of rate them. So the first question that we ask here is, why do you want to be an Air Force officer? So let's hear what this person has to say about that. Sir, I want to be an Air Force officer because I want to serve my country. I really like leading others, and I think I will make a good officer. Also, the Air Force is the most interesting branch to me. One day, I'd like to be an engineer. Being an officer combines these interests perfectly, allowing me to contribute to my country. It's also a unique chance to develop my leadership skills in a highly respected institution like the Air Force, setting a solid foundation for my future. Sir, what's your take on this one? Uh, one is there's just, it's too, way too short. I, I like to, we, we like to, you know, talk for about three minutes if possible, um, with each one of these questions. So clearly it's just way, way too short. Um, and it really just kind of lacks detail. There's just not really a lot there that gives me any confidence that this person knows anything about the air force other than maybe a cursory understanding of it. So yeah, I would say that this would be a below average answer. Definitely. I would say a, a three or a four out of 10. Really, when you're being asked this question, why do you want to be an Air Force officer? It's three questions in one. It's why do you want to serve your country? Why are you interested in the military? Why not just go join a civilian career? Why do you want to be a leader and an officer? And then of all the branches, are you choosing the Air Force? So you really have to think about it from those three aspects. Why do you want to serve? Why do you want to lead? Why the Air Force specifically? And I don't think she does a good job of answering any of those questions. And it doesn't look like she's really thought through it that much. And I mean, for me, when, I, when I'm when i looking at a question like this, I, I'm interested in how much a person really knows about the Air Force. When I see the, our top candidates answer this, this is a person who's been living and breathing Air Force for for three or four years and, and has been thinking about it. And knows all the aircraft in the Air Force and knows what the Air Force does and maybe has done some things to learn about the Air Force and can really, really talk about and, and give examples. That's the person that you have confidence in that this is something they truly want to do rather than something that they've just sort of thought about in the past few months or so. So th this now this is not to say this person might have that information in their head, but th if you don't talk about it and you're not able to articulate it, the assumption is you don't know. So let's hear an improved version of this after she started working on it a little bit. Sir, um, I appreciate the chance to talk about my goal to attend the United States Air Force Academy. It's really my top choice because, well, it's all about leadership, doing well in school, and honestly, just becoming a better person. Um, the rigorous academic training with leadership development will help me be a really good leader for my airmen. And honestly, it aligns perfectly with my interests in engineering. I hope to uh, serve as an aerospace engineer and design the next generation of aircraft or satellites. But I'm not just interested in becoming an engineer. I want to be a leader who positively impacts others. In high school, being the captain of the robotics team was a huge part of my life. 
We faced a major challenge this past year when we had to build a robot for a national competition. The robot had to navigate different terrains and complete specific tasks, but we hit a snag when our navigation system started glitching. It was due to some coding errors and incompatible hardware as the team captain it was my responsibility to pull the team together and tackle these issues head on. We spent many evenings brainstorming and testing solutions, which taught me a lot about perseverance and teamwork and uh, seeing our robot perform and place third at the national competition was incredibly rewarding for the entire team. I, I've also been part of the Civil Air Patrol, which is kind of like a lead into the Air Force. Uh, taking part in search and rescue missions, I got to see how important it is to be good with technology, but also to stay calm and lead when things get really intense. Um, it made me realize that this is what I want to do, where I can combine my technical skills with leadership to make a real difference. My first choice is definitely the Air Force Academy because well, it's, it's the best place to learn how to be a great officer, but if that doesn't work out, I'm also applying for the Air Force ROTC scholarship and applying to a variety of engineering programs with Air Force ROTC. Right now, Auburn is my top choice. I'm really interested in the Space Force too, since it's all about the future of flying and space, which is super cool. My interest in engineering isn't um, just about building things. It's about solving problems and leading projects that matter. Also, the recent establishment of the Space Force has captured my attention. It represents a new frontier um, in aerospace technology, and I am excited about the possibility of being part of that. So yeah, whether it's at the Academy or through Air Force ROTC, I just really want to be an officer, someone who leads and helps make things better for everyone. I think with my love for engineering and wanting to help people, um, I can be a good leader in the Air Force. That's my big goal. So thoughts on this one? Sir, you can tell she put a lot of thought and effort into her improvement here. I love the different stories that she tells. You get a sense of what she wants to do in the Air Force or she's, at, she's thinking about the Space Force too. The fact that she talked about her leadership and combining the opportunities to be an engineer in the Air Force or the Space Force with leading, I really get a sense that she wants to lead and she cares about her peers. And I could see her leading airmen one day. I really like the fact that she talked about Air Force ROTC too. So she talked about the Academy and Air Force ROTC and she has her preferences down. She's got a plan. It's clear to me that she's thought this through. She really knows what she wants. The only thing I could see that would improve this is to maybe talk about someone that she's met with or officers that she's talked to or enlisted folks in the Air Force that she's talked to to really flush out the fact that she's done her due diligence here and talk to an engineer would be the best bet if she could talk to someone who's worked in the Air Force from an engineering perspective, but even just a leader, a leader in the Air Force so she can really show that she knows what it's like to be an officer. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think, uh, you know, you You'd be surprised. I mean, you can go on the internet, um, you know, on YouTube or on a podcast and find, um, you know, talk about, uh, you know, engineering field like the, the, you know, the Air Force officer podcast, which is no longer, um, they, they've, uh, they don't do it anymore, but they, they've have a really good library of, um, of podcasts from, uh, two individuals who, you know, talk about, I think it was sponsored by the Air Force that talk about all sorts of officer careers and engineering is one of those. So, so you can even say something like, I have really enjoyed the Air Force Officer podcast. And I remember listening to an episode where they interviewed Captain Smith. And Captain Smith talked about engineering and all the things going on in Air Force engineering. What particularly stood out to me was this, this, or this. And then in that way, you don't necessarily have to interview a real person. You can just say that this is kind of the research that I did in order to learn more about about this particular specialty that can is a way to get around trying to find somebody who's an Air Force engineer or something like that. Just tell them, show them that you, that what kind of research you've done there. I'd say also like Civil Air Patrol. I think that's, she's been a part of Civil Air Patrol. You can talk a little bit about her experience there because usually if you've been a part of Civil Air Patrol, 
you've done a summer encampment, maybe at an Air Force base, or you've talked to maybe some Air Force officers while you've been Civil Air Patrol, maybe one of your members, your senior members in your program was in the Air Force or in the military, and you can talk about their experience too. So there's many things here that she could do that would even make this even better. But I'd say this is a really, really good response here. So what grades would you give it, Trish, or would you, do you want to add anything Ooh, more about I, your thoughts here? I would here? say about 8.5. I think it's a really strong answer. And I think to address your points here, good material, she's got so many good stories. These stories are going to come out throughout the entirety of the interview. Whether she was the cadet squadron commander or deputy squadron commander or whatever role she served in her Civil Air Patrol squadron, these are stories that she can use throughout the rest of the interview as well. She just brought it up and touched on it. She could have gone into more detail, like you said, but it is something that she could discuss later on in the interview, too, as one of her core stories that she tells. Yeah, 8.5. What do you think? Yeah, and I, I agree with you. I think 8 to 9, I would say, really, really good. And and this is the kind of improvement that you see in somebody from, say, the first interview to when and then they start thinking about it. And then they get down to something like this, which is if you time it, it's around three minutes. Three minutes is kind of the magical time that you want. It just seems to be that people's attention spans about three minutes long. And if you do anything more than that, you seem like you're droning on. If you do any less than that, but then it, then it seems like you're cutting it short. So if you can get close to three minutes, that's about where you want to be. All right. So let's move on to our next question, which is how do you handle peer pressure? So let's listen to this candidate. Sir, peer pressure isn't something I experience very often. I try to surround myself with the kinds of peers who, well, uh, wouldn't put me in that position. But there was one time I can think of that really challenged me when I was treasurer of our class last year. First, I try to live with honor and really relate to the honor code. Uh, I think not lying, cheating, or stealing is really important. You also have to hold peers to the same standard, which can be even harder. This is what Air Force officers have to do, though. Living by the honor code definitely helps me do the right thing, which I tried to do as treasurer. So as the treasurer of the high school student government, I was deeply involved in organizing a charity drive intended to support a local homeless shelter. Early in the planning stages, some members of the student government proposed inflating the budget and diverting some of the funds for future projects. They argued that this would ultimately benefit the school, as we could use the extra funds for additional activities throughout the year. This suggestion troubled me. It wasn't just about the dishonesty of misreporting funds. It was a clear violation of doing the right thing, which I believe in. Taking a deep breath, I decided to address the issue head-on during our next meeting. I tried to talk to everyone in a respectful way. I didn't blow up, and I admitted that we have a lot of budget issues, and it's easy to try to find ways to fund more school activities, but I emphasized the importance of integrity and transparency. I asked everyone if they could live with lying about our expenses to try to get them to understand that integrity has to guide our actions as class and student body leaders, especially when handling public funds and trust, just like the Honor Code teaches. This was a really difficult thing to do to um, take a stand. A lot of the people were my close friends. I was met with mixed reactions. Some were dismissive, while others thought um, a lot about what I said. I detailed the long-term benefits of maintaining an honest reputation, not just for us as a student government, but for our schools standing in the community. I also offered a, a solution for the budget. I brought up some ideas for alternative fundraising to make sure we'd be covered for the rest of the year without compromising our integrity. The discussion that followed was intense. We debated, we analyzed, and ultimately, we voted. The decision was to follow the path of integrity. We carried out the charity drive transparently raising funds for the shelter, and I think we made a big impact for them. More importantly, we did the right thing. I'm not sure that we would have if I had stayed silent and not taken a stand. This experience was a defining moment for me. It reinforced my belief in the values of honor and integrity and doing the difficult thing when it's right. As I look forward to a potential career in the Air Force, I understand that the challenges I will face as an officer will be uh, much larger, and it's these principles that will guide my decisions and actions. I'm ready to uphold these standards and be an Air Force Academy cadet with character. Hopefully I'll be 
an Air Force officer and leader of character one day. Well, I, I like this one. This kind of question can also be rephrased as a doing the harder right rather than the easier wrong kind of question or about the honor code at the Air Force Academy or just any sort of moral and ethical question here. So this is a really, really good answer. What I really like about it is the story that the person does. So what they do is they set it up really well in the beginning. They talk about what they feel about honor and integrity, and then they do a really, really good story here. What's really important is that everyone loves stories. People who are interviewing you love stories. And if you can make a story that's compelling, that's interesting, that's going to be a winner. They talk about how they were the treasure of their student government. You almost like if you can put that person in your place, that's really, really good to, to do. Whereas when I'm listening to this story, I, I'm thinking, boy, I remember when I was in high school and I remember that when I was on student government and yeah, yeah, this happened to me too, or this is very, very similar. And, and wow, you made a, a great decision here. That it kept me into the story. It looks like that, that this person has really thought about it quite a bit. What I really love about this at the end is the fact that they bring this back to careers in the Air Force. They talk about about what this means for the Air Force and what this means for their future. So it's not just, I'm a moral and ethical person. This is what I'm doing in high school. It's a person who then they move this thing forward. They, they understand what the larger issues are for the Air Force and why this question is being asked. And that's something that's a high level of looking at this is that the person is asking this question for a reason. A lot of these questions are ones that the Air Force says that you need to ask. So the question that you've got to ask yourself is, why is this person asking me this question? What are they trying to get at here? And so by talking about careers in the Air Force, about what officers are expected to do in the Air Force, you're answering the question and you're going back to the person who's, who's, who's asking this interview question. You're saying to them, I understand why you're asking me this question and I understand why it's important. This is a great answer. Your thoughts? Oh, I love the fact that the candidate, that he talks about the honor code, that he knows that the Air Force has an honor code, that the Academy has an honor code, that he is going to be responsible for upholding integrity. And there's some humility in there too. He, he takes ownership for what he's, how he, and he also talks about kind of conflict management when he's admitting that he didn't take over the committee and yell at everybody, he tried to do it in a logical way to get his peers to do the right thing too, which I think is really important. It's, it's a lot easier to do the right thing yourself than to convince your peers to do the right thing. And that's part of the honor code. And he clearly understands that. So I'm just thrilled with this answer. And I think he knocked it out of the park. I'd say the, one of the things you can always do with a winning Air Force answer is talk about the Air Force values and saying integrity first. Definitely. So that would have been something really good that that would have even made it even better. So I would say nine. Yeah, I agree That's with you, I sir. I would say nine. So great. All right. This is fun. All right. So the next question is, what is your biggest weakness? Now, I just talked about before about how that's boilerplate, but I think there are some good reasons to ask a question like this. So let's hear what they have to say about this. Sir, my biggest weakness is definitely procrastination. It's something I became aware of really at first during freshman year of high school and kind of acknowledged, but just lived with it for a while. It's a really big deal. I have to model how I want others to behave. And there just is no room for procrastination in today's world, especially as a future officer. I want to be successful as a cadet, sure. But even more important is when I'm leading airmen in the Air Force as a public affairs officer. That's my goal, at least. This all came to a head my sophomore year of high school. I had this big history project. It was a massive research paper on World War II battles. I kept putting it off because it seemed so overwhelming. Time ticked by, and suddenly, I was staring down this close deadline, which really sent me into a panic. I had to stay up super late for several nights just to get it done. It turned out okay in the end, grade-wise, but the stress and the rush, it was a mess and definitely not my best work. That whole ordeal was a wake-up call for me. I realized that by procrastinating, I was really setting myself up for failure, and that's not who I want to be. So I started to get serious about managing my time better. I got myself a planner, 
and began breaking down big tasks into smaller daily chunks. I also tried out that Pomodoro technique to keep myself focused in short bursts. It actually helped a lot. My parents had been bugging me about this freshman year, and I didn't really listen to them. The project helped me wake up. Not only did I try and improve my time management, but I realized I needed to pay more attention to my parents. It's easy to ignore them, but I started to respect them and their advice more and have more humility. This whole experience really taught me a lot. I'm still not perfect. I know I still tend to procrastinate, but I try to front load all of my work now and treat myself after I finish all of my responsibilities. You can uh, definitely see this in my junior year grades. They've improved a lot because of these skills I've developed. Making these changes has really improved how I handle everything from school projects to my duties in the student council. It's less stressful and I'm doing better work because of it. In the military, I know that managing tasks efficiently is super important, not just for me, but for the whole team. I have to set the example. So yes, I'm still working on it, but I'm getting better every day. I think being able to admit to a flaw like this and then take steps to overcome it shows that I'm committed to living up to Air Force values, especially striving for excellence. It's all about improving a little bit each day, aiming to be a reliable leader in the future. Well, I think he gave a great story and I like this answer a lot. I think a lot of high school students can probably relate to the procrastination side of the house. I mean, some students, not so much, but it seems to me like freshman, sophomore year is pretty typical for students to realize, oh, wait, this isn't middle school anymore. I have to prioritize a little bit. But realistically, it seems like a lot of students who are competing for the academy or an Air Force ROTC scholarship are capable of procrastinating in high school and still doing well in high school. But when you get to the collegiate level, that does not work. And so he might still have good grades, even if he still procrastinated in high school and didn't do things on time. And then when you get to the academy or to your detachment, uh, it's going to change real fast. So I think admitting that he has this issue and trying to work through it with a planner and and trying to really just buckle down and get things done well before they're due is really going to be helpful for him. I like the fact that he also talked about, he admitted that he didn't listen to his parents and now he's trying to pay more attention to his advisors because that's something that's going to happen to you in the Air Force too. When you first commission as a second lieutenant, you're going to have that senior NCO there and they have been around for 15, 20 years. And that's your go-to person. You have to listen to the people that have wisdom and take it in. As an officer interviewing this candidate, that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, okay, this person has the humility to take constructive feedback. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I completely agree with everything you're saying. I like really like the detail that this person goes into with kind of just how he looks at the problem, sees the problem and then works on a solution to it and, and goes into the detail about how he's working on the solution. What you're looking for here is it's a story and what you're doing to solve the problem, whatever that issue is. And then certainly then talking about projecting into the future, which he does at the end here, I think effectively, which shows that he understands that this is important for the military. This is important to be able to manage your tasks effectively. So it's not just what he's doing to improve himself now and, and going into that specific detail, but understanding why it's important in the future, either as a cadet or as a, as a future officer. So I, this is a very, very good answer. I would give it certainly between an eight and a nine. Excellent. I do love that he brought up that he wants to be a public affairs officer because you're definitely going to have to maintain deadline as a public affairs officer. So I don't, I don't know if he's really picked the right career there. With this, a good way maybe to insert something in the end here might be when I visited the Air Force Academy or when I visited the, an ROTC program, I talked with several cadets and they told me about the importance of time management or something like that. And then so that, that then shows that this person does understand the importance of time management and not procrastinating or just thinking about why you would want to do this as an Air Force officer they've actually done some interviews and actually talked to people. Yeah, 100% agree. And the next question is, tell me about a time you led others in a project or goal. 
Ma'am, working on the prom committee really opened my eyes to how leadership isn't always about having a title. Even though we didn't have like an official leader among the six of us, I found myself stepping up in an informal leadership role, especially when it came to dealing with our vendors and managing our events logistics. So starting off, we were this group of six, right? And without a designated leader, it was pretty much up to us to figure things out together. I saw a need early on to sort of guide the process, making sure we were all on the same page and moving towards giving our school the best prom possible. It was about putting the event and everyone else's experience at prom first. I wanted to make sure we had the best prom possible. And so I spent a lot of my free time working on this, really living the Air Force service before self value. For instance, when we were deciding on decorations and themes, it could have easily turned into a mess with everyone wanting different things. I took it upon myself to coordinate discussions, making sure everyone's ideas were heard and that we made decisions that reflected what would make the majority of our classmates happy. This wasn't just about my vision. It was about creating something memorable for everyone. And talking about excellence, I really dug into the details with our vendors. I wanted to ensure that every aspect of prom, from the food to the music, was top-notch. This meant a lot of extra work, like negotiating deals to stretch our budget without compromising on quality, and setting up additional meetings to confirm everything was on track. It was important to me that we did everything to the best of our ability, not just to meet expectations, but to exceed them. Um, I was super focused on making sure every little detail was just right. You know, it was like every decoration, every playlist, even the seating chart had to be perfect. And that's pretty much what I imagine it's like in aviation too. As a pilot, I'll have to be super precise with everything from making sure the pre-flight checklist is done right to reading the instruments accurately to communicating clearly with the control tower. It's all about that commitment to excellence because honestly, people's safety and the success of every flight depend on it. Just like how the success of our prom night depended on us paying attention to all those little details. There was this one time actually where we almost had a crisis because our main decoration supplier had a mix up with the delivery dates. It was crunch time and we needed quick solutions. I managed to secure an alternative through another vendor at the last minute. It was hectic, but you know, it showed me how critical it is to be proactive and ready to tackle challenges head on. Overall, this role taught me a lot about what leadership really means. It's not just about directing people, but inspiring and working alongside them to achieve something great. True leadership is about inspiring people, motivating them, and yes, sometimes stepping up to guide the team through challenges when there's no official leader. This whole experience showed me how to lead from within a group, how to listen carefully, and how to bring people together to achieve something truly memorable. And these skills are incredibly important in any team-oriented environment. I believe these are the kinds of challenges and responsibilities that would be a part of life in the Air Force, where excellence and selfless service drive success. So what's there not to like about this answer? I mean, I think it's- a, I'm think trying it's to a, think of something, sir. Yeah, I mean, it's great. It's a great answer. But I see with, a, with some people that I've worked with is when they're asked a question like this, there tends to be the, the, the initial answer before we start working on this thing is, these are all the great things that I did. And there's no one else who is doing anything in this. Or in, there, in other words, this person really isn't working with anybody else. Or maybe they did work with somebody else, but they just talked for about three minutes about all the great things that they did to accomplish something. And so that is a, a significant problem, I think, with when when the candidates are asked this initial question is that it, it comes off as selfish. It comes off as I'm a superstar and the other people that I'm working with are just a bunch of flunkies that are just working for me. So well, that's a fine line to, to walk, sir, because the interview is about you. You're trying to highlight yourself. How do you do that in a way that comes across as the qualities that the Air Force is looking for in, in its officers? Well, remember that, you know, nothing is done in the Air Force by yourself. You're not ever going to do anything by yourself. Even if you're a pilot in a plane, you've got a ground crew who's helping you fix your aircraft. You have weapons people that are that are making sure your aircraft has the proper weapons. You have people who are directing you where to go from as air battle captains or whatever else. I mean, so you're never alone no matter where you are. And so 
I think the way you get at this is to acknowledge what other people are doing and talk about how you would never be able to do it by yourself and certainly talk about the things that you did. There's nothing wrong with talking about things that you did, but I think it's important also to talk about what other people did and talk about how you would never be able to get this done without the help of others. So I think you can walk that fine line. I think with enough ways that you talk about the things that you did that brought the project to conclusion, but at the same time, giving credit to others. Do you think that this candidate did that? I do. I mean, I really do. And they talk about in the beginning when they had the people together and all the things that they're working to coordinate and things like that. I think they did do that effectively. I really liked as well that he, he mentioned flying. A lot of students mentioned flying. A lot of students say they want to be a pilot. But once you dig a little deeper, there's not a whole lot of knowledge there other than I want to be a pilot. And I love the fact that he brought up the, a pre-flight checklist or reading his instruments. I mean, even just knowing the verbiage of those, what a pre-flight checklist is, means that he knows at least something about aviation. And he's not just saying he wants to be a pilot and hasn't done any research into it at all. Sort of landmines might we want to try to avoid if somebody wants to be a pilot in the air force and is being interviewed by a intelligence officer or a or a finance officer or a logistics officer what what is based on your experience what what does someone who's just like hardcore pilot how do they need to navigate that and and why is it important to understand that you're interviewing with a person who's not a pilot well i think it's definitely a good life lesson to know your audience regardless of who, what situation you're in or who you're talking to, you need to know your audience. So when you find out that your evaluator, academy liaison officer, is not a pilot, it's good to talk about the fact you want to be a pilot, but you don't want to go into so much detail that their eyes glaze over. You're showing that you've done your due diligence, but you're not going to be talking to them about pilot stuff because they're not a pilot. And recognize that they're 50% of the officers that graduate from the Air Force Academy go on to do some sort of fly or some sort of rated career field. However, 50% aren't. And a lot more for Air Force ROTC. There's a lot of non-rated officers out there, and they have a very important job to do in the Air Force. And, and so it's very important to acknowledge that it's not just about pilots as much as they might say otherwise than the Air Force. And you have to realize that, it, like, just like you said, it's a team effort and we have to fill all those other career fields in the Air Force. And I, I would recommend that even if you want to fly, because you never know what's going to happen. You might not be pilot qualified. I mean, that's exactly what happened to me. I went to the Air Force Academy wanting to fly and I was not pilot qualified based on my vision. So I chose intelligent. What are you going to choose if you can't fly, if you want to fly? and you can't go down that path for whatever reason, what will your backup be? And it's good to know what those different career fields are in the Air Force. Intelligence, logistics, air battle manager. What do you want to do? So find out what those opportunities are. And if you can learn what type of officer your ALO is or was, learn about that career field. Go find out what a finance officer, what a contracting officer, what a maintainer. What do these people do? Back to your question, know your audience. Don't talk them into oblivion about pilot things if they're not pilots. Yep. And I think that shows a maturity, I think, uh, being able to, like what, what you just said about how 50% of Air Force officers are not rated. So it shows a maturity uh, on, in your part on the, on the person who's, who's the interviewee regarding that you understand the Air Force and you understand that there's more to the Air Force than just being rated pilots. I, I, I see this oftentimes also with, for example, with the Navy or the Army saying that they want to be special forces or they want to be a SEAL or something like that. And then they just stay on that SEAL, special forces, special operator. While it's laudable that you want to be in special operations and you want to do special forces, you want to be, be all that. Problem is it doesn't really get at what the service actually does and it's only a very very small percentage of the air force or the army or the navy or the marine corps and it's likely that you're not even going to go into that field anyway given how lower percentage it is when you start going down those kind of uh, rabbit holes it kind of shows off that you really don't know 
about the service in general, that if you start talking about just all about special operations and things like that. I definitely advise students to try and find out if you want to be an engineer and you want to go to the Air Force Academy, how many engineers graduated from the last Air Force Academy class and commissioned as engineers? Because some years it's five, some years it's zero. What are your opportunities from the academies versus ROTC? What does that look like? And then lastly, if you do want to fly, you should know what the Air Force inventory is. You should have an idea of what is an Air Force aircraft versus a naval aircraft. And there are differences. So look them up. Yeah, this reminds me of, of my podcast with Captain Roberts, who was the professor of naval science at Auburn University and is now part of our consulting here. He said that he's done some interviews where the person comes in and he asks them, what, what do you want to fly? And the person says, I want to fly an F-15. And so there's no F-15s in the Navy. Having those kind of answers, is, it shows that you don't really know about the Air Force inventory, inventory versus the Navy inventory or something like that. So just make sure if you start talking about those things in detail, make sure what you're talking about. And also why you want to fly that aircraft too. Not just the name of it, but why have you chosen the F-15 or the F-22 or the F-35? Why? What is it about the mission that you like? What is, it, what is it about the aircraft that you like? Absolutely. Trish, what would you give this grade to this one here? I have to say it's another eight. It, it's another not eight, nine. It's up there. It really is. Uh, a lot of these answers have been really, really good. I would agree with you around eight, eight and a half. Is there anything um, that this candidate could do to, to make his answer better? I think they've done a real good job of maybe talking in specifics about how other people helped a little bit more, right? I do think that they do talk about other people in here, but sometimes what I like to do when I'm working with candidates is give me some specifics here. Say like I divided people up into six people and I realized that that Jim was really good with music. And so I gave Jim the opportunity to get the DJ together and pick the music and decide kind of how the venue was going to look at as far as music and things like that. And I don't think we ever would have been able to have the music and the kind of a uh, setup we had for this prom without Jim. Definitely giving credit to other people and recognizing yeah. people's strengths and weaknesses as a leader, because that's going to be something that you're doing as an officer. You're going to have to see what which one of your NCOs is good at certain tasks or recognize when they're not good and mentor them in it. By giving specific examples like that of a person who's great at music or a person maybe on the committee that is really good at online stuff, putting together the, the website or something like that, you can give credit to that person too. That kind of gives the person who's listening to you concrete examples of, of how you integrated other people into other than just kind of nameless people that are helping. I like naming individuals that were on the team too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because then it shows you, okay, this guy or Gail knew who their team is and knows who the people were that, that made this, made this happen. That can kind of take it to the next level. Yeah. I think this candidate is right there. And with, with the suggestions that you've just made, that's like yep. a 9.5 or a 10. I'm really enjoying these this, these ratings of, of candidates with all that we've been doing here. And I think it really gives a good amount of insight into the answers that these uh, interviewers are looking for. And even with really, really great answers, how they can even improve anything more. Absolutely. Looking forward to covering Navy next. All right. So we'll, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the ROTC Scholarship Podcast. If you like what we're doing, please leave a quick review. If you have any questions or want more information about ROTC or our consulting services, please visit our website at rotcconsulting.com. Take care, and we'll see you next time.